Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we have been in the book of Mark. The book of Mark. This is the first gospel we believe to have been written. Uh, other, other authors uh, used Mark as, as a reference. Mark, whose name is John Mark. John Mark was a really close companion with Peter, the, the, the disciple of Jesus. And therefore, you know, we got to get Peter's stories written down, right? So well, that's what John Mark set to do, and he wrote this document. And we've been going through it piece by piece, and we will continue that today. Before we get started, have you ever had someone... Well, first of all, we all have painters in life, right? We all have painters of all, in, in different areas of our life. Maybe I'm the only one. I don't think I am. And, we, and we've talked about that. But have you ever had somebody, not only that you love, but somebody who loved you become your hater, your naysayer, your, your dissenter, your throw a wet blanket on a person? Have you ever had that happen? Somebody who's supposed to be in your corner, somebody who loves you, and they become your hater? Painful, isn't it? Painful. Jesus had this happen to him. Mark, Mark 3, 20 and following. One time, Jesus entered a house, and the crowds began to gather again. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. Let's stop. Jesus' ministry was gaining steam. He, he, he's, the, the crowds are becoming more and more frequent. Now him and his guys can't even find time to eat. You ever been there? Like, wow, we're thankful to have a job, and, and then the company's really busy right now, and everything at work is busy, and I, I, you know, we, we can't take breaks anymore. We can't, you know. We become so busy. On one hand, things are going well. On the other hand, you're swamped, and that causes stress, right? It causes stress in your life. Do you feel those shoulders begin to Come up in your ear, feel those knots, see that's where you store your stress, or where you store your stress at, you feel that rising. I think Jesus and his disciples are feeling that maybe a little bit right now. Couldn't even find time to eat. Let's, let's put you in, in, in Jesus' seat right now, how he might be feeling. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. Stop. We're talking about his family. He's out of his mind, they said. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. But the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said, He's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. Can Satan cast out Satan? He asked, the kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Look, look at this is interesting here. He, he hasn't forgotten about what has happened. His family's there, saying he's out of his mind. I think it's stewing within him. It's agitated. It's still there. It's lingering. You ever been there? Yeah, you ever left one meeting that was just horrible and you're mad about, and you're ticked off about, and then you go to another meeting, but your mind's still over there. Or, or you ever been at somebody's house for a party or a holiday and somebody said something to you that really hurt you badly and, and, and as you walk away, I wish I would have said this. Anybody do that? Anybody do the game where I wish I would have said? Yeah. Jesus is still angry with him. These dudes are calling him Satan. And I think he, he still remembers his family just saying he's out of his mind. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. Did you hear that back there? Bam! And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man to plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who can tie him up and then plunder his house. I'll tell you the truth. All sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. We 
he told them this because they were they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. So J Jesus did just did a teaching there about uh, about uh, about how he's not Satan, <laughs> right? Uh, about blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to preach on that today. Okay, that, that that's not my topic today. I want to talk about Jesus's issues with his family here and how he's been hurt by someone who. We love them. But I know some of you are like, but I want you to talk about that. So let's talk about this for a minute. People are like, what's it mean to, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? And I'm going to give you like a minute talk about what that means, and then we're going to go on with it. And maybe we can talk about it again some other time, maybe even next week. I don't know. We'll find out. People just said that he was Satan himself. Like, pretty, pretty bad accusation. Jesus goes on to say, and it says, uh, uh, where was I at? I'm sorry. Um, uh, he said that if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, that you, you cannot be forgiven for that. That's interesting because the same Jesus was being crucified on a cross while his executioners were mocking him. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So we specifically here speaking out, you can't blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Well, hey, first of all, what's blasphemy? Blasphemy is, is, is when you um, sin with the mouth or with the uh, pen or the keyboard. It's when you, it's when you make light of, mock, lie about God. But it's blasphemy. And here he's saying, if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, you can, uh, you can never be forgiven. And some of you are like, man, I hope I didn't do that, <laughs> right? And we, we all kind of suspect that Boog has been doing that, right? He's been blaspheming with the Holy Spirit. So, bad news for him. No, I, I, I kid. So what's blaspheming with the Holy Spirit? Here, here's where I think Jesus is getting at. Now, people have tried to, to pick out particular sins and say, oh, it's adultery. You don't read that. It's adultery. It's murder. It's it's, it's, it's none of those things. Um, simply put, if, 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 if God has told you that, that, that Jesus is the Christ and you say he's Satan, that's blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Okay? I could talk a lot more on that. I'm not going to. to. Let me just add one more thing before we move on from this subject. If that worries you in your heart or soul, gosh, I... I would never want to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. That would, or, or Jesus, or, or, or the Father. I, I would never want to do that. That's that would be horrible. Gosh, I hope I haven't done that. That would break my heart to know that. You don't have to worry. I mean, you're not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. If you have that kind of a heart, you wouldn't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I know I didn't explain much there, but I know some of you guys are nerdy like me, and you'll want to talk about that. We can talk about that more later, but not today. Jesus' ministry is going well. It's growing. He's got his 12 disciples. So busy they don't have time to eat. Getting a little stressed. And his family shows up and says he's out of his mind. So he did this teaching. Then Jesus' mothers and mother, mother and brothers came to see him. Mary. The same lady who had the Magi come to her. The same lady who had an angel come and say, you are going to give birth to the Messiah. That lady. Then Jesus' mother's mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus. And someone said, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Wouldn't this be embarrassing? I mean, could you imagine being at war? And they know what it's up. She's, they're out there saying, he's out of his mind. Bring him out here. Tell him to come. Wouldn't that be embarrassing? Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then he looked at those around him and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Have you ever had Anyone who loves you become your naysayer, your hater, 
the one who speaks out against you, who brings you down. Hurts, hurts extra bad, don't it? We didn't see it coming from that way. Now we, ex we expected the crowds, we expected the world to, to be a hater, we've become accustomed to that, but to those that love us, it hurts. It hurts. So what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Number one. Here's a thought I want to give you all. First of all, you're not Jesus. So you're like, really? You're not Jesus. You're not God. So you could be wrong. You should be wrong. One of the things that we encourage people here at, here at Branch Way United Methodist is, is that you develop relationships so close where people can be brutally honest with you even if, the, even if those conversations are awkward, they can be offensive, and they can hurt. Even then, they have permission to speak into your life. You could be wrong. You are not Jesus. Jesus knew who, who he was. He knew he wasn't wrong. This hurt him. But there are times in your life where you may be saying, I've, I've got plans. I'm really excited about this. And somebody comes to you, like, you know, I love you, so I'll be honest with you. Your plan is here. I'm concerned about it. So can we talk about it? You could be wrong. And we need not be people who have such thin skin or so easily offended. And why is everybody so easily offended anymore? Am I wrong? People are so easily offended anymore. Right? We need to be people who can take some constructive criticism in our life. We need to be people who can hear criticism that isn't meant nicely. Like, you know, could they be right, though? Like, they were complete jerks with the way they just spoke to me or posted about me or whatever. There are things that they said there that could be right. But what, that happened to me yesterday. But the things that are, that are partially true that I need to learn from. They could be right. Listen. Listen to those that they love you. There's a, there's a real chance that they're coming to you because they love you and they're right. They have experience here. And they don't see you go down the wrong path. So let's, let, let's just consider that first. Secondly, remember, the reason this hurts is because they love you. And they do love you. They do love you. Um, you've got to recognize, uh, well, as I read this, I'm like, Mary? Why are you coming here saying Jesus is out of his mind? You know who he is. You were there at his birth, obviously. You knew how he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. You, you, you saw, you know, you asked him to turn water into light. You know who he is. Why would you say this now as his ministry starts to roll? Sometimes... Because people love you, they will do. They will make poor decisions. Verse six, and I don't have it up here. Verse six already said that they were. They started planning to kill Jesus. Mary sees the writing on the wall. Son, just just come on home. This, they're going to kill you. They're going to kill you, Jesus. I know how this goes. Please, I I love you, son. Please come back home. Let's, let's cancel the ministry. Let's rethink this. So, you know, they're going to kill you. Guess what? She was right. They're going to kill him. And that aches her heart. That aches her heart. And she don't want to see him get killed. Because she loves him. You ever been there? <laughs> right? They're, they're, they're right. They, they, they love. They love you. We don't want you to take that job because, because we, we're afraid it's going to pull you away from home. We don't want you, and we love you. We don't think you should take that job because you're not going to make as much money, you know, being involved in that career than the other career, which we know that you're capable of doing, and then you have, have money and be comfortable, and I want good for you. And so sometimes people that love us say things that are hurtful and that uh, can come across as the pain on you because they love you. So as people say those things, sometimes it's, it, it's helpful for us to remember they love us. That's why we're saying this. They wouldn't say this if they didn't love us. Right? I, I think we've all been there. We've all, we've all been there. 
Third thing I want to say right this is this. Is this. Um, they might come around. They might just come around. As, as it goes on, as, as your choice uh, begins to manifest itself, whatever that might be, and they see it happening, and they still may be afraid, but they'll come around and they'll be your supporters. Let me give you an example. Um, I was in business school at Indiana University, and uh, the Lord called me into ministry. And I uh, accepted a full-time job uh, that I also started immediately upon my graduation. Uh, at First Baptist Church, Clinton, Kentucky, as their full-time youth pastor. Um, that wasn't the plan at all. Josh went to business school. Josh was interviewing with Fortune 500 companies. You know, that, that, that was the path we're supposed to go on. But God said, no, no, I want you to go into ministry. I want you to take a job in the ministry. So can you imagine, and that's what you do in the hallways, you know, your senior year of college, uh, you know, hey, do you guys get a placement to get a job yet? You know, have any interviews coming up? And yeah, I got, so they're my buddies, they're like, they're like, yeah, I, I got a job with Intel, moving to Seattle, or moving, you know, oh, cool, Intel. Josh, how about you? I'm a youth pastor. <laughs> what? Like, yeah. So there you go. You know, that's weird. And I knew there was a conversation that was going to take a long time that I needed to have. It was with my grandfather. We all played a game with my grandpa huh? with some tire section hats. <laughs> it's called, a, it's a little game we call 100 Questions. And you might as well just sit back with a snack and an iced tea and just, and just, just, just to know you're, that's what's about to happen. You're in for 100 questions. My grandpa was a deacon at Deer Creek Baptist Church. When you were in church leadership, you get to see a different side of church. Right, church leaders? If you just come here every Sunday and drink coffee and smile, it's happy and you're not going to believe this, but we're a church family, and families sometimes have friction. Right? And when you're in leadership, you see the, I mean, you, you the veil is pulled back, and you begin to see that friction. And for some of us, that can be really, oh my gosh, this is supposed to be church, you're not supposed to have, have, have friction. I will argue that we're a family, most families are dysfunctional, and so are we, so join the family, you know? I mean, that's just the reality of Uh... <laughs> Where was I going with that? I'm all right. <laughs> Families are dysfunctional. 100 questions from Grandpa. 100 questions from Grandpa. So Grandpa got to see that side of the church for a long time. He had been a deacon before I was born. Uh, he's seen good times in church, bad times in church, and he saw how ministers sometimes retreat. I think he figured that this probably would not be the, I would not be making the, as much money as I could have as my buddies that worked at Intel. And he was very concerned for me. And we played a game under questions. He was not a fan of this. Straight up. Grandpa was not a fan of Josh going to the ministry because it's going to be hard. Because I've seen how pastors are treated. Because as a, as a leader himself, he knows how, how sometimes he... he he did not support this. I mean, he, he's been very honest with me in his life, which is one reason I love, love him so much, love him so much. Are you sure about this boy? Are you sure? The money you're going to make. Ah, you know, are you sure about this? I, I knew that day, Grandpa was my, Grandpa, he was, he was my naysayer. Don't do this. This, you know, there's other ways you can serve in the church. He was my naysayer that day, but I knew he did it out of love. Well, Grandpa came around. Grandpa, I, that was my point. Grand, folks can come around. Uh, there's my certificate of ordination. I was ordained at Four Rivers Church in Kentucky back in 2005. That was a lot. Of, that day just stood out to me just now, honestly. It's 15 years ago. If my math's correct, I'm almost 40. That can't be right. Thank you. <laughs> For the, I'll, I'll 
Now, there's something special about this uh, certificate. This is a, I love their tradition here. I should have taken a picture of the back of it and brought, to, brought you. But on the back of this is everybody that was in attendance today. And they just, it was, it was almost like a yearbook. Remember back, I don't know if they do this still today, but back in the day when you get your yearbook, everybody, God bless, have a great life, you're, whatever, and sign their name. So that's all over the back of my organization. It means a lot to me. Uh, this, is, this is my pastor, uh, Brad Henson. Uh, at Four Rivers Church, he's a senior pastor there, and then this name means a whole lot to me. Yes, he does. Right he signed the ordination certificate. Sometimes those who are your naysayers are saying that because they love you and it's misdirected. Sometimes they come around. I think we've all seen that in our lives, right? Any, any, anybody know any dads who hated their, their, their daughter's uh, boyfriend? Right? And then, <laughs> some people are like, yep. And then after time, he ain't so bad. And then after time, he's actually a decent dad. And then after time, he's like your own son. Sometimes your naysayers can become your advocates, your fans. Uh, and then that is why um, this document means a lot to me. Grandpa had my back in the day. He loved me. He loved me. People can come around. People can come around. What else do we learn from from uh, Jesus' uh, time here? That I can't go back right now. You know why I can't go back, Lucas? It don't matter. That's fine. I leave it there. Um, one of the other things I want you to see here: What did Jesus do? Imagine the scene. Now they're outside. After he does this teaching and everything, still say, come out here and talk. Just come on out here. How embarrassing would that be? Imagine your mom. I mean, Jesus is probably around 30, in his early 30s now. Like, grown man. And, and can you imagine your mom showing up at your job, with, we're in a business meeting or something, with your brothers like, Hey, can you, we think he's out of his mind. Could you come on out here? So I'm like, this is embarrassing, Mom. I'm like, I'm like, stop. I've had, well, stop. If you've ever been in, a, if you are in HR or make hiring decisions, I know some of you guys are tired. I know you are. Some of you guys make hiring decisions here. I know you're, you're, we're entering into a world where moms now reach out to you. Have you guys had that happen to you already? Moms, re yeah. Moms reach out to you about their son's interview. Like it's a little league team or something. And I think how embarrassing is that? That's what's happening with Jesus right here. Mary is outside. You know, I've been like, hey, weren't you the one that said he was conceived by the Holy Spirit there, Mary? But now he's out of his mind. Well, which is it, girl? They're going to kill you, Jesus. Come out here. It's just, we'll make up any excuse we can right now to get you out of those doors. They're going to kill you. Right, but yet it was still his calling. It was still his calling. Same lady, Mary, was at his cross. Imagine that being at his cross. She knew that day might come, and it did. While your son is slowly being tortured to death, and you're there watching. That's, that, that, that's hard, isn't it? That is hard. So when those that love you, when your tribe's not loving you back, what's it, what, what did Jesus do? Come on out here. Come on out here. Talk to us. Let's go home. Let's go home. Jesus, your, uh, your mom and brothers are outside asking you to come out. What about in here? This is my family now. These are my people. This is my brother. This is my mother. We have to surround ourselves with people who do have our backs. We have to surround our, when you have naysayers, find the folks around, find other folks around you who can support you. Make sure you don't hear me incorrectly. Don't look for people who still care about you and are being honest with you. You can always find somebody to tell you you're doing the right thing. I can go around town killing puppies. And I can probably find somebody to tell me, you're doing the right thing, Josh. You keep on. You can, there is good money to be made just by telling people what they want to hear. I'll be, there, there is a lot. It's not good money. It's bad money. But there's money to be made. There are businesses ran just by telling people. And churches, you tell people what they want to hear, they will subscribe. They will donate. They will. I'm not saying that. Jesus found other people 
in that time of his life, when he had some of that, when he had some naysayers that were people that should have been closest to him. Guys, we're not crazy, right? Like, this is my family. You, you 12, you're with me on this, right? Like, this affects all of us. We've thought about this, we've prayed about this. Tell me if I'm wrong. But that's, I don't think I am, you guys. Find others during that season to surround yourself with, to, to get you through. Because we need people. We need people. We need family. We need brothers and sisters in Christ to see us through. I know, I know it's hurtful when those who love you become your haters. And they do it for all different kinds of reasons. Sometimes jealousy, sometimes other things, sometimes bad motives. But sometimes, but it helps me to realize that many of those times, it's just because they love you. And you know they're wrong, but they love you. And that's why they don't want to see you hurt. So that's why they're saying that. Sometimes those people come around. And until they do, seek, seek other counsel, seek other friends who stand in your corner. Seek people you can bounce out of. Hey, hey, you know, mom is out there saying I'm crazy. Is she right? Or, or, talk to me here. Be open with me. Find other family, if you will. Now, I think my last point is this. I think it's important to notice I don't think Jesus meant this as, um, as a, what's the word, uh, uh, symbolically as we would think. I think he really calls us to be brothers and sisters, to be a family. As, as a church, he calls us to have each other's backs. Now that's, I know one small occasion of that in this church right now, that is, is we have a student ministry. We started last year. This is the second year for it. I'm really trying to, to develop that sense of we're in this together. We got each other's backs. When we're at school, and maybe we're not on all the same teams together, all the same organizations together, but but but, but we got each other's backs here. You know, we can count on each other. We are a team, in, in a very real sense, we are a family. I think Jesus really wants us to to understand that as a church. That's one of the reasons why we're reaching, why we're trying to help some folks in Pakistan, all the way to the other side of the world. Because they're just not people from another nation. They're our family. And our family's in trouble, and our family needs our help. So we take care of family. Let's pray. God, we love you. You're a good God who teaches us about love. You loved us first, what the scriptures say. And we know we can always count on you to be there for us. First, God, I pray that we would not be a people who just look for people to say the things that we want to be said to us. We can find those people if we want. I pray we seek out wise counsel. I pray we seek out people who love us enough to be honest with us, and we love them enough to hear them. Even whenever that chastises us, even when that's a little bit painful. Pray that we recognize when we're wrong. But Father, I also recognize there's times when we're not wrong. And it's deeply painful to see our, the folks who love us, who are supposed to be in our corner, become our naysayers. Help us through those times, Father. Help us to love them anyhow. Love them through that. Help us to understand their motive for saying this. And it could be because they're jealous. It could be because for, for some bad reason. But help us remember just maybe, just maybe it's because they love you. And their love right now is misdirected. But they're doing it out of love. And help us during that time to to find others who can be our fam, who can be in our form. We're like, hey, you know, we got you back here. We know this is not a popular decision with everybody in life, but, but we're on board with you. We support you in it. We're praying for you with it. We got you. We got you back. Help us at those times, God, because if I had to guess, several of us in this room are, are going through those times right now. 
Father God, we love you. We thank you for all that you've blessed us with. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen.